So what happens after risk determination, if you think back to the beginning? Um, um, so, so you've heard a very nice talk outlining some of the basics of the IDE submission. Um, so what I'm going to do is quickly sort of run through the rest of that flow chart I showed you at the beginning um, and just give some tips. And then if there's a little time, I just, uh, you know, wanted to mention a couple of things about genomics and some of the things we've heard today. Um, so just very briefly, um, so we've talked about these three, you know, being exempt or, or non-significant risk or significant risk. And so what does that mean if your ex uh, study is exempt? Just very briefly, of course, at this point you know you can begin your study assuming if you have all, you met all the other appropriate requirements you have, informed consent and IRB approval where it's required and things like that. If it's non-significant risk, again, we come back to the abbreviated requirements that you've heard about, and here's a list of, uh, I think, most of them. A lot of them are things you don't have to send, well, you don't need an IDE submission, and that's always the big thing people don't want to do. Um, um, you have to, you do need to follow the other abbreviated requirements. Some of them are things you would do in any way, like IRB approval and informed consent, monitoring in many cases. Um, we do have requirements for records and reporting, but um, you don't need to send annual and final progress reports. Um, the really the only thing that I can think of uh, that you would need to send in to us would be any unanticipated adverse events, so just as those arise. Um, and in the case of in vitro diagnostics, those can be very difficult to identify even, so often, you know, you won't even identify uh, adverse events related to the test. Um, but um, we don't need annual and final progress reports either in that case. So mostly it's internal paper, you know, internal record keeping that you need to do and a couple of other things. You are, one important point is it's not that you didn't need an IDE, but you have, you are considered once you have followed the abbreviated requirements or begin to follow them, that you are considered to have an investigational device exemption. Um, so and that still means you're covered under the regulation and you do have some requirements that I've just outlined. Now, obviously, if you are significant risk, you have to get, you have to receive an approval of an IDE submission on top of the other requirements and you will have to you know, do a annual and final progress reports. Um, and so this is just a handy table that compares the two um, things, the two categories. Um, and obviously investigator agreements as well, that has to be taken into account in a significant risk study. So I wanted to run through the elements that you heard so nicely outlined before and just give a few tips based on, um, you know, uh, a few tips because, um, you know, I think filling out, you know, figuring out what information to send to FDA, especially the first time you're doing an IDE, but even later can be confusing. So um, you do need to sort of describe why you're doing the study, but this is not an R01, so it doesn't need to be a full justification of a hypothesis, I mean, more of a summary, I, I sort of think of it, it could be like an abstract or something, but we want to know why, why you're doing the study and just briefly what the motivation for it is. A detailed description of the device under study. So now, as you heard, we want to know all the components and how it works, and certainly to the degree you can illustrate things in pictures and diagrams, that's very helpful. The previous studies, um, preclinical and clinical, um, and one thing is that this is, would include the analytical validation studies you've done, um, you know, and sort of why, you know, the evidence that's leading you to put this in a trial. It, you don't, you know, things that aren't relevant, that have been studied about the device or the technology that aren't relevant to the study um, are not as important. And this has to, we need enough um, analytical validation and information on the device that you're going to use in the study. Now, one of the challenges here is, of course, that the, this, the, in genomics, the devices are changing rapidly. Um, 
and there can be many modifications over the course of a study. So to the degree that's happening, um, you have to consider modifications, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. The risk analysis, I mean, basically we need to know how we are mitigating, you are mitigating risks, and if the benefits outweigh the risks of the study. Um, one thing, um, well, you know, there's patient monitoring and follow-up, um, inclusion and exclusion criteria. We do look at the informed consent document, um, and um, the in some cases the informed consent, like I can remember one study I saw where the informed consent document had nothing to do with the study that was submitted to us. So, you know, there are, you know, it's nice to have another level of review in some cases. Um, sample size, number of study sites, if that is um, relevant with a justification. Again, the administrative tips. We have an e-copy program and actually, um, you know, the e-copy program allows you to submit things on CD um, and there has been a paper copy. If it hasn't gone away, it could go away. So I would check before you submit something to see if you have to print out all the paper you heard about. Um, one thing I would point out is that you should be ready to respond. You know, we have a 30-day review window. That's, we got to make a decision within 30 days. That means that we will be asking, you know, if informa we need information, if we need to figure, get clarification on something, we're going to email or call you. Um, you will specify a contact. You should be ready to respond to those and know that you may get a request saying, I need to know X and, you know, you may, like, need to get it to them tomorrow so that the decision can be made within the deadline. So just that's something to be prepared for so you're not taken by surprise. And does it need an alternate contact? So if you're not available um, as a contact, that somebody will be there around to, to respond. Uh, and then if you're responding to uh, deficiencies from a previous IDE or making changes in the IDE, you should provide red line copies so that we can see what has been changed. Um, formatting an IDE, some tips. I mean, first of all, there's the cover letter, and there is no specific format, which I think is surprising. Well, I think a lot of people the first time go on the website and look for all the forms and then can't find them. Um, there are no forms that are required. Um, but that means we can see all sorts of variations in what we see. And I would say, just like for a grant, you know, um, we are going to read all that paper you send us, but, um, you know, my eyesight is going, you know, so make it readable. Don't use tiny font. Um, make it well organized. Make it logical, sections and subsections. You don't have to, again, don't have to follow a particular format but we need to be able to find the evidence. When you're reviewing a sizable document, you know, that becomes very important. Annotate your tables and describe figures. Use figure legends. You wouldn't believe how many times you just get a figure with nothing on it or tables, then you don't know, you know, things aren't labeled. Um, going back to the table of contents with hyper, um, uh, you know, going back to the idea of organization, a table of contacts and in the contents and in the electronic form with hyperlinks makes it uh, easier for us to find things. Or you know, even without a table of contents, the PDF if it's well bookmarked. You know, different reviewers have different ways they like to find things, but these are all things that are very helpful. Um, and what you're trying to do here is make it easy, reduce the, um, you know, make the review go more smoothly. Um, you know, to the degree that you can explain things to us initially, we won't be coming back and asking questions. Um, when you are presenting data, don't just present a table of numbers and maybe some summary statistics. Describe and interpret the experiments. You know, lead us to the result you're trying to, to the interpretation you're trying to say. I mean, there have, I've also seen this where, you know, people just sort of present the, you know, analytical validation, accuracy, here's the table, it's X, we don't know what it means, what the original sort of threshold was that was pre-specified. Um, you may need to provide line data, um, not always, but sometimes. 
And so I think just like with anything else, a grant or a paper or anything else, you know, it would be helpful to have someone unrelated to the project read the thing and see if it makes sense to them. Um, because if it doesn't make sense to them, it may not make sense to us either. Um, but on the other hand, I do want to say don't let that perfect be the enemy of the good, which is that don't wait forever assuming, you know, trying to, um, you know, guess what it is we'll need and, and fill everything in. If we, you know, the, if you don't send us the information we need, we will ask for it. So I think that, you know, the consequences, and this is the benefit of interactive review, um, the consequences of not getting it quite right or not, it's not the end of the world, you know. It may take a little more work on the back end, but it's not, um, you know, it's not going to sink your IDE if you didn't get it exactly right. And if in doubt, ask. You know, talk to the reviewer. Talk, we have an IDE staff. I'll, I'll get into this at the end. Um, we have a number of venues in which you can ask questions, and that's probably the best way. FDA actions on IDE. So you've submitted your um, IDE. It's been it's day 30, and you receive notification that you are one of three things, approved. You can begin enrolling subjects once the IRE, IRB approval is obtained. And when we um, approved with conditions. So this means that you can begin your study once you have IRB approval, but you have 45 days to make certain changes. They could be changes in the informed consent document, other changes. They aren't going to be big things like analytical validation studies. Um, but, you know, oftentimes there are tweaks that uh, FDA is going to request. Um, but it's not going to hold up the study. You just have to provide that information. The third thing is you may be, it's rare for IVDs, but you may be disapproved. And then um, if you are disapproved, you will receive a letter documenting the deficiencies, the reason for the disapproval, and you can essentially submit a supplement or a new IDE addressing those deficiencies. There's no limit to the number of IDEs you can send. Again, this is not a grant. So, you know, um, you know, oftentimes, maybe sometimes people go through multiple, more than one cycle, but they will get, they do get to approval in the end. Um, the, um, but still the disapproval is rare and usually it's for ma very major things. Now, again, I want to reiterate, these decisions are made based on safety, the risk as opposed to benefit. But when we're talking about benefit, we're not talking about having an effective or a, a IVD that has been demonstrated to be effective. I mean, and in many cases, that's why you're doing the investigation in the first place. We want to know that it, oper again, operates well enough to protect patients within the study and that the study is not absolutely crazy thing to do. Um, and that you've mitigated the risks of the study appropriately. The other thing I wanted to say about letters uh, here is that there, we also have recently added two sections called major and minor study design um, uh, considerations. We cannot, we don't make a decision on the IDE based on um, the study design, but we can't help ourselves to make comments. Um, and we do identify things that we think may be issues um, in the study design. And so we can provide those, but they are in an, essentially an appendix to the letter. They're for your consideration. Um, you know, they shouldn't, they don't affect the trial, but they're just things we have identified and we want to let you know this is what we think about the study. After you have an IDE, there are a number of things you may end up be submitting to us. Obviously, annual and final reports, um, amendments, supplements, um, uh, which could be new studies using the same device. It can be an, a supplement to the existing IDE, um, or they can deal with modifications, and it just depends. Um, so just to discuss modifications, because I know this is an important point. In general, if you made a modification, you would have to submit to your test, you would have to submit um, or a change in the study. You'd have to submit that to us, and we would have to re review as a supplement, we would review it and approve it, and then you could institute that. However, there are 
there are different types of modifications, and not all modifications are created equally. Um, you know, what we're really concerned about with reviewing are major changes, changes that are going to affect the safety of the trial, make major changes to the performance of the device. Um, if certain types of changes that aren't going to be as significant, and this is language from the Code of Federal Regulations, um, the, can be provided to us in a five-day notice. So developmental changes in the device that don't constitute a significant change in design, um, so on and so forth. Um, the changes in the protocol that do not affect the validity of the data or information in the approved protocol, the scientific soundness of the investigational plan, or the rights, safety, and well, or welfare of the human subject. So there are many changes you will be, you could make that won't, that will just require you to let us know within five days. And then some minor changes um, can be made uh, in the following areas without, uh, just in the annual report, so not even a five-day notice. Um, if they don't affect the validity of the data or the information, um, uh, uh, that was used to approve the protocol, the, again, the safety of the patients and the scientific soundness of the investigational plan. Now, who makes this determination? Well, again, this is a determination made by the sponsor and probably the IRB in the context of the study. You have to make an honest assessment as to the significance of the change and then decide whether to notify us. And in many cases, if we find out and disagree, we'll ask you to submit the proper report, supplement, or, mod, you know, or supplement, depending. Now, just to um, close this part out, I just want you to remember that, you know, we, this, and this is probably one of the most important points of this whole day, which is that we want to help you. Um, and we've, over the years, have developed many mechanisms to do that. And the biggest one being the pre-submission process. Um, then the ability to be interactive. You can call or email us if you don't understand any aspect of our letters or other communications or requirements. Um, and I had a couple of slides here that I guess must have dropped out on what, um, um, uh, just on resources. But I did want to point a couple of things out. So the pre-submission uh, program covers everything. And we get pre-submissions from I'm submitting this and I need to figure out what the right experiments are to really just like I've developed something and I'm not even thinking about a regulatory submission right now or I'm not planning one right now but I want to come and just tell you about my technology and we get all of those. Um, it's a venue for you to get feedback and, and the pre-submission allows us to respond formally, to consider the questions and to assemble a team of experts that will respond to those questions. The other thing, we have a number of guidances on IDs, and we'll, I'll make sure these get posted. Um, CDRH Learn, Device Advice, you know, information on our website. The other resource I wanted to point out is our databases. Now, for IDEs, we do not post um, any information, you know, uh, but we do post information, uh, what are summaries, uh, review summaries for devices that have received marketing approval on our website. And I often say this is probably if when you're starting out and trying to figure out what to do, even though obviously those devices had to meet a much higher bar than yours will, if you have a similar device, go look and see what they did to get approval and it'll give you a good idea of what FDA might care about in terms of validation. Um, I think they're really, it's a really excellent resource. So, um, you know, and again, we'll make sure those links get posted for your use. Um, so with that, I will end this part. And I just wanted to mention one other thing. And I, th I think I'm just something I've been thinking over, of over the, well, we've been thinking about for a long time, but really came up over the course of the day, which is that I think we've heard a lot of, you know, we've heard a lot of, first of all, I want to thank everybody for really great discussions um, and for being here. I think and it really illustrates how important it is to be interactive in this process. I mean, we're dealing with a technology, you know, in genomics that is really paradigm busting in so many ways. 
Um, I think we're seeing, you know, return of results in a way that we haven't seen before, the ability to generate data and incidental findings in a way that we haven't seen before. And so this is new ground for everybody. So, you know, I think, you know, you all posed really great um, questions of situations that are arising that we have not yet necessarily seen at FDA, but that we will have to consider. Um, and obviously this will take a discussion with sponsors and with the community. And, it, you know, th working uh, through things like this, through NHGRI, our, uh, I I meetings like this are critical to us. Um, and I think you should take heart in the fact that we don't necessarily have all the answers. We're in the same, everybody, you know, these are undecided questions. People don't agree. And this is something we expect to work out in the context of real studies and real submissions. Uh, working with you and having that discussion with you. Now, having said that, I did also want to just very briefly mention, because it, it came up a few times, the Precision Medicine Initiative. Because this is such a different type of technology and a different way of thinking, but so critical to precision medicine, um, FDA has actually developed, you know, has actually been involved in the Precision FDA and thinking about new ways in which we can approach this technology. Um, so we've d d had discussions with the field about standards, analytical standards, and that's something we're very interested in developing. So everybody has a clear bar, knows what to do or how to develop tests without necessarily having to come to FDA. We've been very interested and, and have actually been working with ClinVar and ClinGen to better understand the use of genetic database, databases and sort of ex uh, crowdsourced evidence and how to provide that evidence to patients and providers so they can benefit from, from that information and that work. Um, and finally, uh, Precision FDA, you also heard about those. So this is a um, cloud-based platform that we just uh, started last December, so, uh, or, or released last December. It's only been around for about six months, but uh, this is really a place where you can come and benchmark software, look at its performance, um, have a community discussion. And so we've been working with NIST to post reference files. Um, the, and we've been issuing, we just closed our second challenge, uh, look at benchmarking and measuring the reproducibility and accuracy of pipelines. So this is something I wanna encourage all of you who are working on genomics or are working on programs to consider, you know, coming and talking to us about um, how it can be used because we, we do, um, you know, the more the science advances, the more we understand how to validate these and how these technologies operate, um, that'll obviously be, be help us regulate this technology much more efficiently and it will benefit everybody else in terms of developing this and getting it to patients. So, sorry, that was my unscheduled little sort of summary, uh, but we can now, you know, questions.